All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Just One Man, a podcast taking the Sunday school stories that you grew up with, doing a deep dive on those. Hopefully that opens up your horizons, um, brings you closer to God and your relationship and understanding of the Bible. So we've been doing the flood. And last time we had discussed that we would um, examine these events considering the physical description. So we've been in chapter 7 of Genesis, and we noted some of the spiritual parallels uh, between this account of worldwide judgment and the future judgment to happen at Christ's second coming. We also noted the picture of Christ seen in the day the flood began, in the way the family of Noah entered the ark through one door, and the way the door was closed by the hand of God ensuring they remained in the safety of the ark. So we need to better understand what God is doing here, how he accomplishes it. So let's reread some of the text from our last episode, um, and then we'll move forward to be able to finish the chapter. So we're going to go back to verse 10 in chapter 7, and it says, It came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wives, and the three wives of of his sons with them, entered the ark. And they and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. The these those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind, of all that was on the dry land all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, together with those who were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth one hundred and fifty days. All right, so we're going to examine the events portrayed here in four steps. First, we're going to review the details of the text, just so we can be sure we have the full understanding of what Scripture tells us concerning the flood. Secondly, we're going to consult other Scripture to learn the source for the water that God used to destroy the earth. Third, we're going to understand the effects of the flood on the earth. And then fourth, we'll learn where the water went after the flood had ended. So beginning in verse 11, we hear the flood began with the fountains of the deep bursting open and the floodgates of the sky being opened. Now the Hebrew words for fountains and floodgates gives us a clear picture of this event. Fountains means a spring of water coming from the ground. Floodgates is the word arubah, which means chimney or window. So imagine a hole in the clouds and water literally pouring through the hole or the opening. So water is going to fill the earth from two directions, up and down. And it falls, and the water from above, it's going to fall for 40 24-hour periods. And it falls across the entire globe for that time. There is no present-day meteorological 
condition that would produce such an event. Uh, you think about it today, rain clouds drop water that are collected through evaporation elsewhere on the planet. If the entire planet were experiencing rain simultaneously, then it would quickly come to an end because there wouldn't be any new source for the water since the evaporation of the water couldn't happen while the whole earth is experiencing rain. So clearly there has to there, there must have been a source for the water above, which is different than what we experience in the world today. When we look at verse 14, we hear that the animals God had delivered to Noah, they voluntarily entered the ark in pairs. There's no indication that Noah led them, he didn't chase them, um, he didn't have cattle prods, he wasn't dragging them, he wasn't leaving little um, trails of snacks to lure them to go into the ark. It doesn't, no indication of that, okay? It says they went in on their own on the appointed day. So God clearly delivers them and brought them into the ark. And every animal that we have today is represented on the ark. The Bible says every land animal after its kind entered the ark. And if you've listened to the creation story, then you probably notice the similar language in verse 14 that was also used in the creation account uh, back in chapter 1. Just as God created all land animals, now he's working to preserve them. So we note that the animals were selected by kind, and that's a special Hebrew word that describes an animal type that was designed to diversify into many subtypes over time. For example, one animal kind we may have received, um, all canines. By bringing kinds to Noah, then God ensured all subkinds would be preserved as well, without the need for as many animals to be on the ark. And some of those subkinds exist today, while others that um, left the ark later went extinct. So finally, we understand that the animals that were left on the earth perished in the flood, and their bodies were buried by the mud and sediment deposited by the floodwaters. Thousands of years later, these skeletal remains, um, you know, they're discovered by archaeologists, deposited in layers, piled atop one another. Next, let's take a look at verses 17 through 20. Moses describes the ark being lifted up by the water and floating on the water. So the water kept rising until even the tops of mountains were covered. In fact, they were covered to a depth of 22 feet. And Moses tells us this depth so we can be sure the ark cleared every mountain as it flooded, as it floated on the water. Based on the ark's dimension, even if half of the ark um, were submerged, it would still have cleared the mountains. Now, if you read ahead in chapter 8, um, then you'll see there that the mountains before the flood were much lower than the ones we see today. You know, archaeologists, they've been puzzled by the way, you know, woolly mammoths preserved frozen in ice are often found clustered together on the tops of mountains or hills. Well, a logical answer is they fled from the water to the highest point, then drowned when the water finally engulfed the peaks. Now, finally, God confirms that the flood met its intended purpose. It says every land animal, every person who remained on earth perished under the flood waters. Even the birds died when they lost a landing place and they couldn't remain, you know, just aloft any longer. And so to ensure every creature died and to allow time for uh, decomposing remains to settle under the mud. The water remains on the earth for a long time, specifically um, for 150 days. So that for 150 days, uh, if you were to look at the earth from outer space, all you would see is water, um, except for this one little speck, and that would have been the ark. So before moving to the second point, we got to take note of we should take note of that's how the world looks. It's all water. Um, you know, if it if you were looking at it from space, it's just it's just water. 
but go back to the book, go back to chapter one when we did creation. Like this is pretty much how how the earth looked at the beginning. It was formless and consisted um, of a formless deep. And the spirit of God floated or fluttered, fluttered over the surface of that deep. So we see God restarting creation in, in some kind of sense. The world, again, is covered. And now the ark, which we talked about um, on the last episode, is a picture of Christ. It floats above the surface of the deep. So this imagery, it's very similar to draw a point for us. This is a restart of the world. It's made made necessary by the sin of man. This is God um, taking out the Nintendo cartridge, you know, blowing it to get it clean, putting it back in, um, and and restarting it for it to work. So, having looked at the text, now let's go and answer this question of where did the water even come from? So, first we got to remember that all the work of creation was completed on the sixth day. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 say, For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So the point of that is that there wasn't any new water that was created for the day on that day of the flood. All the water used in this event, it already existed somewhere else in creation. Secondly, we remember that the world has never even experienced rain. So the source of water must be something very unique and not like what we experience today, which we we have already discussed this. The normal water cycle of evaporation, clouds, rain, that's not happening yet. So if we look backwards in scripture, then we find the source and it is, um, there's a clue there in the creation story itself. So if we go back to Genesis 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters, which were below the expanse, from the waters, which were above the expanse. And it was so. And I'll repeat from what I said on the creation episode, um, if the expanse is being expanded in waters from waters, if that sounds really confusing, join the club. So as the world's being created, God placed water above the expanse of the air in the world. And when we studied this, remember we referred to this suspended water as the atmosphere, which is true, but it also... But it is also clear that God stored more water above the earth than uh, we see suspended today. The atmosphere, I mean, must have been especially rich in moisture, um, or there is a supernatural suspension of large quantities of liquid water stored above just for this moment. Um, Scripture would seem to support the latter conclusion. In Psalms, um, the psalmist alludes to such storage. Um, Psalms 148 verses 4 and 5 says, Praise him, high heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Then in Psalms 33, 6 and 7, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap, and he lays up the deeps in storehouses. We also have uh, Peter's testimony concerning the waters of creation. 2 Peter 3, 5, and 6. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So I think it's interesting Peter notes that the world was created out of water. And that really keeps with Genesis 1. Peter adds the and by water. He's talking about God's judgment of the flood. Peter is teaching that 
Some of the water of creation was set aside in the heavens and reserved for this day for judgment. God knew it was coming. He made plans for it by storing water above the heavens, and then he released that water on the appointed day. So the source of the flood was water stored in the heavens. But remember, we've already seen that there was a second source. The great springs of the earth were opened up. Verse 11, the word open means to cleave open. The Hebrew word for that means to cleave open. So like to split open, like um, like splitting a log of wood. So this description suggests that God tore open the face of the earth. And looking at the world after the flood, we can see the result of that ripping open. The continents were formed by the splitting of the earth. And buried under the earth were springs of water set loose by the movement of the land masses. Imagine the destruction created by this sudden violent movement of the continents. I mean, it would dwarf any type of earthquake we've ever seen, probably accompanied by uh, great volcanic eruptions. And since we're already talking about the remaking of the earth's features, we can just go ahead and jump into point three, the effects of the flood on the earth. So we just noted the movement of the continents and the deposits of the fossilized animals around the world under layers of mud. Also, the movement of so much water across the earth, both during the arrival and then later whenever it recedes, that would have resulted in just like massive erosion. So especially when the continents... Uh, drained, which is in chapter 8, the weight of all that water would have cut huge channels and canyons on the surface of the earth. I mean, look at the erosion that was witnessed in the days following uh, Mount St. Helens eruption. You know, um, just that being very small in comparison to the entire earth. But this explains like really cool places like the Grand Canyon, um, you know, being created, the creation of river valleys and cliffs from this massive erosion. So next we mentioned um, how the atmosphere before the flood would have been very different due to the huge storage of water above the heavens. Now all that water's dropped. So the atmosphere is going to be drier or be very different. It's going to be drier, have fewer clouds. Furthermore, the storehouses of water below the ground, they've been released. So that mist that rose up to the water to water the ground, that's not going to be available anymore. Instead, now rain is going to be a regular feature on the earth. And furthermore, the movement of some continents to um, some continents to farther reach North and south, that's going to lead to a wider variety of climates, some with harsher weather than before. So remember, before, all the land was located in the same place and experienced, you know, pretty consistent, likely similar weather patterns because it's all there together. Now, continents have been split and water um, scattering animals and plants everywhere, and the new land is going to experience new climates. That's why scientists find fossils of tropical plants in the middle of deserts, or fossils of fish on the top of mountains, or woolly mammoths flash frozen in ice. Because of this, I mean, you think about if you were on the landmass that um, gets shifted to Antarctica. I mean, that's going to be an extreme difference in, in what it was before. So then let's answer uh, this last question here. Where did all the water go? At first glance, it's kind of a tough question because it really seems impossible to answer this question. How do you eliminate enough water to expose seven continents, leaving a third of the world's surface exposed? Well, in chapter 8, Moses tells us that the water recedes over a period of months. And then in Psalms 104, we get a concise description of where it went. Uh, so 104, it's verses 5 through 9 is what I'll be referencing here. So it says, He established the earth upon its foundations, so that it will not totter forever and ever. 
You covered it with the deep, as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At your sound, at the sound of your thunder they hurried away. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which you established for them. You set up a boundary that they may not pass over, so that they will not return to cover the earth. So in verse 5 here, the psalmist credits God with creating the earth. Then in verses 6 through 9, um, he describes the flood upon the earth. And at first, the psalmist says that God covered the earth with the deep, te home, meaning the waters of the flood. It was like throwing a garment over the earth. So the waters were covering the mountains, as Genesis 7 told us. Then he says, the waters fled the land at God's rebuke. They hurried away, which communicates, again, a clear image of water receding quickly in a violent rush, creating those canyons that we talked about. And then we notice the key part. Mountains rose and valleys sank. This is what happens when water recedes. God takes parts of the land and makes them taller and takes other parts and makes them lower. So no new materials are being created. Land is simply just being displaced. Mountains on earth now are much taller than those in the time before the flood. And the valleys deepened are the trenches in the sea. The deepest valleys on earth are in the sea, including the deepest of all, the um, Marianas Trench. It extends seven miles down. If you think about this, if you were to put Mount Everest um, in this trench, its peak would still be a mile and a half under the water. That's how deep that is. So as God creates, created these trenches in the basin of the oceans, the water did what water naturally does. It seeks the lowest point. It ran off all these high slopes of the mountains and into the valleys in the oceans. So that's where all the water goes. So this lesson, like it really gives us a chance to focus on the how of God's work in the flood. You know, we um, we didn't take time to make many applications or ask questions about how God wants us to put this knowledge to work, but we should still let this lesson draw our minds to the awesome power and wisdom of the God that we serve. So I'll leave you with this thought um, as we wrap up a very short episode today. If God has the power to work these wonders on a worldwide scale, is there really anything that he can't do in response to our needs or circumstances? And knowing his wisdom, can we ever doubt that whatever may happen in our daily lives, it must be according to his wise and masterful plan? So just something to think about. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, super short episode today, just because I wanted to wrap up um, taking a look at the impacts of the earth from the flood. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the show. Um, please share it with your friends. And if you want to follow me on any social sites, I'm on Twitter at BrandonTubbs24 or on Instagram at OKistBrandon. Um, we'll see you next week. Y'all have a good one.